Yeah, hi folks. Now, does anyone honestly believe that The Voice in Australia is happening organically, completely separate from co-governance in New Zealand, when both are driven by the UN's UNDRIP? And does anyone honestly believe that the fact-checking and censorship of opposing voices regarding the uh, voice and co-governance is not orchestrated? And does anyone honestly believe we have democracy when we are controlled by the UN, WHO and WEF? And does anyone honestly believe we have democracy when Christopher Luxon keeps outlefting the left? Then came some substance, a policy on renewable energy. Today, New Zealand is amongst the worst in the OECD. We have uh, one public EV charger for every 95 EVs in the country. National is promising 10,000 new electric vehicle chargers, costing $257 million, saying people are buying and infrastructure needs to catch up. Now, folks, I'll start it off here today. Julian, mate, nice to talk to you again. How are you? Yeah, g'day, Sean. Thank you. We're um, into it again, and it's all happening. All so, right. Um, yep. What happened Sean. with your demand? You got a lawyer to write to TVNZ and Sanjana Hatatawa, Sanjana Hatatawa, um, saying, "Could you please apologise and withdraw your claim that I'm a racist?" Did you get any formal response from either of them? Yeah, we did get a response from TVNZ and they said they were going to um, adjust, in inverted commas, uh, some of the content of their online um, reporting about me. And my lawyer looked at that and said, no, that's completely unacceptable. They didn't actually um, address um, the issue. go back on, address the issue at all. It was just a sort of, you know, a bit of, bit of dressing, changing the order of the sentences and a few things. But it was nothing to do with the um, calling me a racist nothing to do with saying I was the purveyor of um, the hate speech and disinformation. All of that stuff was just left intact. So he said, no, that's it. Um, you've had your chance. We're going to have to, you know, because this was hurtful and false. Mm. And um, these guys have been um, uh, just, uh, you know, the media has had free free range to be able to destroy people online, say what they like. Nobody holds them to account. There's no pushback, and they're out of control. And he said, "No, that's enough. We're going to we're going to go for it." So he filed proceedings in the court on the 29th of August. Now, folks, uh, to understand that disinformation BS or what's driving that disinformation BS, we need to go back to our speech silencing communist. This will also be important in understanding more about mis and disinformation online a challenge that we must, as leaders, address. Sadly, I think it's easy to dismiss this problem as one in the margins. I can certainly understand the desire to leave it to someone else. As leaders, we're rightly concerned that even the most light-touch approaches to disinformation could be misinterpreted as being hostile to the values of free speech that we value so highly. But while I cannot tell you today what the answer is to this challenge, I can say with complete certainty that we cannot ignore it. To do so poses an equal threat to the norms we all value. After all, how do you successfully end a war if people are led to believe the reason for its existence is not only legal but noble? How do you tackle climate change if people do not believe it exists? Now, there are those far more learned than I who will argue where the source of the scourge of disinformation lies. Within your own campus, you have those who will argue that the current problems of disinformation are not the result of algorithms or trolls, but of, quote, asymmetric media structures, decades in the making. I'm not here to argue either way, because at its heart, we're, what we're in the middle of is not really a new problem. Thomas Ridd, argues that the modern era of disinformation began in the early 1920s, during the Great Depression. In an era of journalism transformed by radio, newly cut throat and, quote, fast-paced. 
He goes on to argue that it's since come in waves, including in the mid-2010, with disinformation reborn and reshaped by new technologies and internet culture. Others point to the acceleration of the information and disinformation flow that comes with each new technology that enables mass duplication and distribution, from photocopiers to cassette tapes. The only thing that has changed is speed. But as Red concludes, either way, the stakes are, quote, enormous. For disinformation, it corrodes the foundation of our liberal democracy. Now let's go to Australia and listen to the language they use and start connecting the dots. Sky News Australia primetime host Peter Credlin also fell victim to the RMIT fact checkers after she dared to expose the true scale of the Uluru Statement. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is not a one-page document. It's actually 26 pages in all. And we only know that because the government's been forced to release the full document under Freedom of Information, FOI. And it's the whole 26 pages of the Uluru Statement from the Heart that every Australian should read, not the PM's sanitised one-pager, before they cast their vote in the upcoming referendum. Credlin was slapped with a false information label, but she fought back and she won. Labor is not just trying to change our constitution. It also wants to introduce so-called misinformation legislation. Sound familiar, folks? Which will embolden the fact-checking industry. Uh, misinformation. Misinformation. Exact same language. Misinformation. The misinformation which is there. Some misinformation spread. Um, misinformation. If social media giants do not have a fact-checking system, which in this case favours Labor's policies, they could be fined billions of dollars. Well, if you think this problem is bad now, just wait until Labor's misinformation or disinformation laws pass. It will put a rocket under the fact-checking industry and you'll have people coming out of the woodwork to appoint themselves as fact-checkers and to get access to the money from these platforms to perform this service. Because as the platforms themselves have said, including before my own Senate committee, if they are fearing the consequences of fines and potentially in extreme circumstances, even jail time for their executives, if they permit there to be misinformation on their platforms, well, they're going to be engaging in massive preemptive censorship in order to protect themselves. And the only way they've found to do that so far is to engage these so-called independent fact checkers to do so. So we're going to see uh, posts being taken down left, right and centre. We're going to see things being labelled misinformation across the board. Now let's see what Zuckerberg's meta has been up to. But even though for Australians this is your decision to make, it has been influenced by foreign funds which have propped up activist fact-checking bodies. Australian journalism and political debates were censored on Facebook by this censorship machine. It's now been censored by Facebook and criticised by both the ABC and RMIT's so-called fact-check I think the same things happened to discussions last week on this program about the full 26-page Uluru statement, the statement that wants treaties and land reform and, and compensation as a percentage of GDP, all of that. Um, this is what we've got to look forward to, I guess, as Australians, given this misinformation, disinformation game that's going on around The Voice is what the Prime Minister now wants to lock into legislation if the parliament is stupid enough to vote for it. And as a result of this investigation, Meta has been forced to cut ties with prominent Australian university, RMIT, which has been pocketing up to $740,000 a year from the tech giant's Irish subsidiary. It is foreign funded activism and make no mistake, it has already impacted what you have been able to see on social media about the referendum. Activists masquerading as fact checkers and people are having their access to legitimate stories suppressed by, by their actions. This is Rita a giant mess and I think the RMIT fact lab uh, and potentially their fact check because there's two separate departments here, uh, their credibility is being ripped apart. This investigation also exposes the unaccountable and lucrative Wild West fact checking industry for failing to follow its own rules. The censors say their goal is to restrict information that delegitimizes governmental 
industrial, and news media organizations. That mandate is so sweeping that it could easily censor criticism from any part of the status quo, from elected officials to institutions to laws. Tech giants have paid an opaque body known as the International Fact-Checking Network millions of dollars to police the industry. But this investigation has uncovered evidence that the rules are simply being ignored. These are the rules governments around the world have been promised by Meta are being followed to make the system impartial. Uh, we've heard in today a number of examples of um, where we may have made content review mistakes on conservative content, but I can assure you that there are a lot of folks who think that we make content moderation or content review mistakes um, of liberal content as well. Yeah, so the new word for censorship is now mistakes. So, who are the people and the organisations profiting of political censorship? Melbourne University RMIT has a direct commercial relationship with Facebook, which has allowed it to access internal systems and downrank entire newsrooms, preventing you from seeing the content. The university used the powers Facebook has given it to throttle Sky News Australia's Facebook page with false fact checks multiple times this year, breaching the meta-endorsed IFCN code of principles and preventing millions of Australians from reading or watching Sky News Australia's journalism. The operation is run by former ABC journalist Russell Skelton, who is unashamedly partisan on social media. He yeah, and here's a dern. He has published dozens of tweets criticizing conservative politicians and the journalists he is supposed to fact check. More recently, he campaigned directly for The Voice. Yeah, he's the same kind of hack as this guy, Sanjana Hatatua. Now, if you think this is not happening in New Zealand, think again. We have Meta, where we have fact-checking. And if you scroll down to New Zealand, we have AAP, which is Australian Associated Press, and AFP, Agency France Press, and they do the fact checking on you. And of course, the UN's UNDRIP is driving all this. Indigenous Rights and the Voice. These individual and collective indigenous rights are set out in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP. And of course, New Zealand bought into this BS 13 years ago. I come with humble heart to celebrate the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The New Zealand government has long discussed this matter and has recently decided to support it. Yeah, now folks, I urge you to watch the entire Fact Check Files report as it goes into much more detail than I've given you. It's a real eye-opener. Anyway folks, I've posted all the relevant links below.